Banks is naming the song. Big Come on. I'm still one or two. I hate Let's Banks. do this. You ready? How about you? All right. Okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> Any bankers in the audience? You know, Donna told me to start with a story, and I'll do that in a second, but I just learned that I have another minute to speak. Yeah? Well, just took one. But I would love to learn um, about you guys for a second. So in a show of hands, uh, which ones of you came from Israel to uh, Icon today? Just so I can, can see. Wow, that's a, that's a big ratio. Okay, who is an entrepreneur? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Investors, raise your hand. <laughs> we need them as well, right? Okay, Corpor corporate. Okay, ladies. It's a great ratio, by the way. All right. In 2008, I was a young banker on Wall Street, and I, re I was doing my training when the markets collapsed, and I remember pretty vividly sitting downstairs on, uh, on Wall Street at a coffee shop at the days of the crisis. In front of me were two gray-haired bankers checking out the Blackberries in disbelief, and we thought it was the end of the world. And by the way, I'm saying Blackberries because iPhone was yet to be introduced in 2008. Fast forward 11 years, the Dow has more than quadrupled, and we were led to believe that the financial services industry is thriving, as is our economy. I'm here to tell you that the demise of banking has begun 11 years ago. And I'm here to talk today about the death and the rebirth of the banking industry. My name is Dobby Francis. I'm the founding partner of Group 11. Group 11 is a financial technology-oriented fund that over the past few years have invested about $130 million into some of Silicon Valley's most disruptive technology companies, fintech, financial technology companies, sorry. We're a great supporter and backer of Icon, their largest donor last year, and hopefully this year, we'll see. And, <laughs> and uh, about 65% of our portfolio companies are Israeli-related, right? So either Israelis uh, that came to the States or companies that um, have their headquarters or development centers in Israel and operate here as well. So let's talk about uh, the financial services industry. Well, it's huge. Earlier on, one of the investors from uh, Andreessen has mentioned that it's about 20 to 30% of our GDP. At the narrower, at the narrower uh, definition of fintech, it's about 7% of our GDP, still big, $1.5 trillion of our GDP is related to financial services, 13,000 financial institutions in the Americas, and about 5,000 of them are banks, 8.3 million people are working in this industry, sorry, 6.3. So a big, a big industry and obviously a shining beacon to many other financial technology industries throughout the world. So now let me ask you a question. What percent, and I'm framing it, so, so listen carefully. What percentage of financial uh, services revenues were taken away to date by financial technology companies? And I'll give you a hint, okay? Yesterday you read the news about Stripe? Okay, so there are a bunch of multi-billion dollar companies that have emerged over the past few years Avant, Affirm, N26, Stripe, Revolut, Shine, Varo, and the list goes on and on. So what percentage do you think of traditional financial services revenues was taken to date by financial technology startups? Raise your hands or just shout. You know, the best answer is close, they always say close to zero, right? <laughs> Might be right. Hey, anybody else? One. Okay. Well, the answer is that nobody knows. How about that? But our belief is that it's way less than 10%. We know in the most advanced area of financial services, which is consumer banking, disruption is close to 10%, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But in, in general, if you're looking at more traditional areas of financial services, banks, uh, uh, sorry, banks and, uh, and insurance companies, it's very close to the 1% uh, area. So the opportunity is still there. Venture capitalists, of course, sense uh, a blue ocean when they see one. And what you can see here, is that they have more than 23x their investments into financial technology since 2011. You can see the white bar, I see people taking photos, I'll explain. The white bar is US, the other one is, is uh, global, and the green one is prediction for the end of the year. So a lot of money is being pumped into financial technology companies by venture capitalists. Now, before we talk about the future, a few seconds about kind of like the past, the past 10 years, we try to frame it, and I see people are taking photos, so I'll move. We try to frame it basically in four eras, before 2009, 2009 to 14, 14 to 19, and the future of fintech. The easiest one is to talk about 1.0, okay? And the easiest thing is to do it through the lenses of a family, okay? So we have Nicole. In 2006, Nicole is a Gen Xer. 
Raise your hands if you subscribe to the, you know, to the age of Nicole or were born between 65 to 79. You can't say that in public. Hey, you don't. Uh, it's a range, Yasmin. Okay, so most of the audience uh, is, uh, is Gen Xers, okay? So we have in 2006, we have Nicole, we have her daughter Melissa, who's a millennial, we have her daughter Ali, who's a Gen Z. You can see their ages, actually. And back then, digital disruption was a home fax machine, okay? So her communication, Nicole's communication with her banker was, let's go visit the branch to deposit money or to take what's ours. Let's use our home fax machine to confirm wires. Let's hold a phone call. And the biggest innovation back then was, uh, you know, uh, Swift, ACH, Fed's Funds Wire. See, the one from Coversy is looking at me. Yeah, I mean, that, that was the way it was. Now, fast forward, the financial crisis hit. And free catalysts basically prompted the financial technology revolution that is upon us right now. So let me quickly uh, uh, take you through them. Typically, I do this presentation, it's, a, it's an hour, but Donna really insisted it won't be. <laughs> so she took like five slides, okay? But I'll just talk about it. The great financial crisis, obviously a, a, a double whammy for banks, right? Uh, you know, 2008 hits, uh, $10 trillion of wealth were lost, most of it responsibility of financial institutions. Financial institutions lost the confidence of their clientele on the one hand, and on the other hand had to face significant regulatory pressure in the form of the Dodd-Frank Act, Basel II, Basel III, Volcker rules, and the list goes on and on, right? Banks were forced to take uh, the defense versus the offense, and we're seeing that until this very day. We'll talk about that. The second thing is the mobile revolution. We jumped from 1G, which was 2.4 kilobytes per second, to 3G over a course of 19 years, okay? In 2009, actually, a year into the crisis, 4G was introduced to the public, and most recently, we started introducing 5G. 5G is one gigabyte per second, right? So you can kind of like run the range of how fast and, and, and how far we've come. Smart devices today in some emerging countries are affordable. You can buy them at less than $30. Penetration in the US of smart devices since 2009 to now has jumped from 20% penetration to 70% penetration of all households. I mean, that, that's a, a significant uh, number. And, and of course, I mean, the smart, the smart devices that we have in our hands, that we're using, that our kids are using, oh no, not for the same uh, reasons, uh, are as powerful as the computer was for uh, the Apollo mission back in 69. All right, the third thing, vast demographic changes. Well, look around, 30%, no, 50% of the workforce today is comprised of millennials, okay? By 2025, it will be 75%, so today it's 80 million people. And if you look at those people and what they really want, all they want is an end-to-end -end seamless, seamless solution on the mobile device. It doesn't matter what service they're seeking, okay? And, and, and of course, that, that is of course, because many of them were born with the smart devices in their hands. That's one thing. The second thing, they're very much united in their dismay, dislike to financial services institutions. In fact, in a recent survey, 71% of millennial respondents said that they much rather go to the dentist than visiting a bank branch. I mean, that's how bad it was. Oh, okay. So, these kind of like were the three forces that have emerged together to bring us to where we are today. Fintech 2.0 is not that interesting, actually. From 2009, 2014, we've seen some innovation. Most of it was around lending areas, peer-to-peer -peer lending, etc. You've seen some uh, unicorns that have emerged, like SoFi. But, but in those years, the foundations were built to the innovation that we're seeing nowadays. Now, let's talk about uh, Fintech uh, 3.0. Remember, there was Nicole, the mom, then there was Melissa, the millennial. Melissa is now, in 2019, she's 28 years old, all right? And everything she does, is on her mobile device. She has a digital agency that is, that is pretty thriving. She has employees. She pays them through Gusto. She takes care of her financial services needs, especially banking, which I'm. You know, she, she, some of her money is managed with Wealthfront. Her life insurance policy is with SoFi because SoFi was her student loan uh, provider. She pays uh, international vendors through Tipalti. Where is Chen? Yep. Tipalti, congrats on the race. We love you, Chen. Yeah, fuck yeah, that's, a, that's an amazing achievement. Uh, she books travel for her, and her employees are booking travel for Trip Actions. Ariel is here. Ariel is not here, but for Trip Actions, it's a great company. And of course, for her business insurance, she's using Next Insurance. And for her business loan, she's using Blue Vine. Ayal is here. All right, and the, list, and the list goes on and on. And many of them are Israeli related technology companies. We'll touch that in a few. Now, let's talk about the future, because we're running out of time. I want to talk about the next, uh, the next 20 years, and then I want to talk about the near future. First and foremost, I'll start with a bold statement. 
the next 20 years will be the most turbulent times in the history of mankind. That's, that's, that's kind of like a bold statement. Sub-headliner, sub okay? Over the next 10 years, 50% of all S&P 500 companies will either be eliminated, dissolved, or just leave the list because their market uh, enterprise value went, uh, went down. As it pertains to financial services, let's talk about that uh, for a second. Three trends, and then I'll dive deep, uh, deeper into it. First one is big banks to big tech. Okay. How many people work for Wells Fargo? Do you know? Anybody? 200 and about 240,000 employees. Anybody knows what's the enterprise value of Wells Fargo? $214 billion, the enterprise value of Wells Fargo. Do you know what's the enterprise value of Chime? What's that? Say louder. Good, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, something like that, right? How many people work for Chime? A few thousands. Now, how many employees do Chime bring into their mobile bank on a monthly basis? More than Wells Fargo. More than Wells Fargo. In fact, next year, a, a neobanks, and there are about 100 of them, okay, will take about half a trillion dollars from bank, bank depository uh, assets. And the trend that we're seeing and the trend that we're predicting is that neobanks will actually take over the depository uh, market. And that's a, big, uh, that's a big statement. So that's number one. Number two, big state to big tech. So we've seen in Germany a couple of examples. Where we've seen one in Israel actually as recent as this week where licenses are granted to neobanks. So that, uh, that trend will come also to the Americas. And we believe as banks are weakening, and our banks are weakening also on Capitol Hill, we believe that licenses will start to be granted to financial technology insurgents. And of course, that, that means that we'll be able to compete at par with large financial institutions, because that was one of the hurdles, that was one of the barriers to entry. Thirdly, 80% of all US banking uh, will be done online, and of course, most of it will be free. So think about the pressure on large financial institutions that were used to collecting uh, fees, uh, over, overdraft fees, etc. All that I've said will result also in mass unemployment in the banking sector, so bad news for uh, branch managers and branch employees, and a closure of more than 60% of all branches in the Americas over the next few years. Okay, so that's just high level. As we think about the near future and what it's like, and I'll stand here so you can see the slide, you remember that, that pie from earlier, right? So this is kind of like the money that went into financial technology in 2018. Okay, what you're seeing kind of like the, around the sun is uh, the subsectors of financial technology from wealth management to personal finance, lending, insurance, etc., real estate. And above that, you're seeing some companies that we consider as category defining companies in each one of those sub, sub verticals. The ones that are highlighted in orange are portfolio companies of Group 11, where we hold significant stake and are involved either as board members or, or what have you. And the ones that are not highlighted, uh, that's, that's just a shame. <laughs> so, um, as we're kind of like thinking about the future, I just, I just want to say a few things and I'll, you know, on the next slide, some of those companies will appear. American Express is worth today $100 billion. Who said that Tipalti and Trip Actions, who are disrupting different parts of their business, cannot get there? AIG is worth today $50 billion. Who said that Next Insurance cannot get there or, or surpass it? Uh, I, I mentioned Wells Fargo that is worth $214 billion. Who said that Lilly or Chime or any other of the new banks cannot take that? And lastly, Synchrony is worth about $22 billion today. Who said that Sunbit cannot, cannot take that? So, you know, I think that we need to be less critical in the way we think about financial technology and its future and more radical in our approach. Everything is possible. Everything is bound to change, and I'm happy to be at the forefront of that. So, before we conclude, uh, uh, you know, the future is fintech, but the future is also icon. As I said, about 70% of our portfolio companies are Israeli-related. Uh, we are stoked to be supporter of Yasmin and her team in the important mission that is a non-profit mission that they, that they had to support, basically, Israeli founders coming to the Americas. We're excited to be a supporter as a donor, as a mentor, somebody who's involved in the community. I mentioned earlier that last year, um, we were uh, Icon's uh, largest donor. This year, I want to do the same thing, but I also want to urge you to try and surpass me. Any of you sitting at this audience, if you manage to surpass me, I'll be delighted. So I want to present Yasmin with a small check from us as Group 11.
Thank you very much.